a better house. Get a better car. Buy better clothes. And then when God gets finished, tell him to give you the mic and let you testify. Over the course of the 19th century, many Christian thinkers, especially in the United States, began to change their views of money and worldly success. Increasingly, in a departure from traditional Christian thought, American Protestant denominations have suggested that wealth might be a reward from God for holiness. Make money your friend. Touch your neighbor and say, make money your friend. Make money your friend. Make all the money you can. Our friend at Tocqueville also noticed this new American tendency for Christianity to align itself with the materialist values of the rest of the culture. The evangelical mission, he said, appears here to be an industrial enterprise. Bishop Jimmy Ellis III founded the Victory Christian Center in a rundown Philadelphia neighborhood in 1983. His congregation now numbers 1,600. We need to learn how to become friends with money. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. And that's not spiritual riches there. People try to make it spiritual. It's not spiritual. The whole chapter is talking about money. So let me try and understand. So Jesus became poor. Yes. So that we can become rich on earth. That's right. Sunday morning in Levington, Suffolk, England. For centuries, all across the West, people have been coming to services like this. On offer has always been the consoling reminder that there might be more important things in life than status and success. The very fact that we still retain a distinction between wealth and virtue and ask of people whether they're good rather than simply important is in large part due to the impression that Christianity has left on Western consciousness. For Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. It's become rather unfashionable to take Christianity all that seriously, in Britain at least. And yet the fact that we don't may be a major cause of our modern status anxieties. We've largely lost the Christian sense that there is no necessary connection between a person's value and their status in the world. For Christians, Jesus had been the highest man, the most blessed, and yet on earth he had been a humble carpenter, ruling out any simple equation between a person's status and their position in heaven. It's worth dwelling on just how much consolation there must have been in that very simple idea. You can't tell me nothing about this subject because I was poor, but I bless God I ain't poor now. I didn't have no bank account, but I thank my God that I followed him. I thank God. I know what God can do for you if you just follow and obey him. In the City of God, written in AD 427, in the closing years of the Roman Empire, the theologian Saint Augustine explained that all human actions could be interpreted from either a Christian or a Roman perspective. The very things esteemed so highly by the Romans, amassing money, building villas, winning wars, counted for nothing in the Christian outlook. St. Augustine urged Christians to replace Roman values with a new set of concerns, loving one's neighbors, practicing humility and charity, and recognizing one's dependence on God. Practicing those values offered the key to elevated Christian status. Over coffee and biscuits at Ian and Margaret Angus's, Canon Geoffrey Grant explained. How can you tell if someone is spiritually rich? Is that connected to um, if someone's, you know, got quite a lot of income? Not necessarily, no, I, I, I don't think so at all. Do you think that the Lord rewards people who are good with riches? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, if someone's got a, a very nice car, a very, isn't, doesn't that show that God thinks that this person's quite good? Uh, I don't think so. You get uh, a classic example is Mother, Mother Teresa. Jesus Christ came in order to make us abundant so that we wouldn't have to live in poverty, that we wouldn't have to live in lack. 
and that is part of the new covenant that he provided. So there might be people here who've got very little money, but they're very rich spiritually. Rich spiritually, and that comes out when they come to church. And when you talk to them, uh, they are pillars of the village, and they'll go around and spend their whole lives looking after their neighbors. On the whole, if you saw, you know, a hundred rich people and a hundred poor people, would you, in a way, if you had to make a choice, would you say that it, the richer group was the holier group, not just rich, but also holy, and that the poor group was, in a way, maybe the more sinful group? No, I would not advocate that at all. I would not advocate that at all, um, because riches is not an indication of holiness. But before you said it, it was. Excuse me? You, you did no, say I before. said that's a part of it. I was very clear that it's a part of the blessing of God. But you don't have to be rich in order to be holy, because many rich people are not holy, and many poor people are not holy too. So, so the riches itself is not holiness, no. So, so what overall could we say about riches? I mean, is riches a sign of holiness? Or isn't it? I mean, if you had to make a sort of generalization. Riches is a byproduct of walking with God. Jeffrey, what's your own attitude towards wealth uh, for, for yourself? Uh, my car, for instance, is 16 years old. Why don't you get a newer one? Really, because I haven't been able to afford it. And I'd rather have the, the car I know than buy a, a second-hand car. So it doesn't really matter to you what car you drive? Uh, no, I, I, I don't, as long as it goes and is reliable and perhaps that's what God thinks about us. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And you can have plenty of it and don't love it. And the key to that is being generous. How many of the Lord is so good, amen? He's been better to me than I've been to myself. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Coming to hear Bishop Ellis here in Philadelphia, I think what's striking for me is to realize just how much Christianity has been readapted to fit a new American model, to fit the idea of the American dream. And I think what's particularly striking, perhaps to someone coming from Europe, is just how much that consoling message, the traditional message of Christianity, that you could both be poor and spiritually rich has been lost. And that, I think, is a very troubling lesson indeed.